introduce the people who were uh, gracious enough to take part in this discussion. Lucy Murphy, who's been a longtime PMN member and, and, and supporter. Uh, Rick Burkhart, who many of you heard last night in the concert, and also did, just did a great workshop on melodies. And uh, Peter Kuo, who has a strong theater background. <laughs> and uh, I'm going to let you guys sort of. And Mel McGloin Jane has just arrived. Mel has arrived. You are the woman. <laughs> she is a woman. She's a woman. There's another woman up here. So we have gender balance. <laughs> yeah, I'm sort, sort of. of. <laughs> I'm kind of in the middle, so it kind of works. Oh, oh, right. Yeah. <laughs> We've learned a lot about gender. <laughs> and uh, why don't you just each take a second and sort of introduce yourselves and, and sort of what your background is and as it relates to doing, you know, cross-cultural work. Give the title of the of the session. Sure. It's called Identity, Cross-Cultural Work, and Cultural Appropriation in the Theater, Dance, and Song. Yeah, yeah. Everybody, yeah, everybody, everybody give me his mic. I'm, I'm the one that's not important. <laughs> well, but you're the moderator. <laughs> so maybe, maybe we, we can, 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 we, can, can, can we pass really this one loud, around? So. Just yeah. take it out of the stand. Yeah, yeah. 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 You'll pass it around. And... Okay. But we're just going to introduce ourselves real quickly. Um, so, uh, Lucy, would you like to begin? I'm Lucy Murphy from Washington, D.C., uh, African American woman, she, her, hers. Do I need to do this again? I can't need to do this again. I'm Lucy Murphy from Washington, D.C., African American woman, she, her, hers. I am Rick Burkhart. Right now I live in Brooklyn. Um, he, him, I do identify as gay, and I, uh, as far as I know, all of my ancestry is European. Uh, hi, my name is Peter Quo. Uh, Assistant uh, gay, male, uh, he, him, his, uh, Asian American, and uh, primarily a theater producer, director, social, uh, strategic social activist. But for the over the hill gang, what does cis mean? Uh, so cisgender means that you identify with the sex that you are assigned at birth, uh, as opposed to transgenders who uh, do not identify with the uh, the gender that they are assigned at birth. CIS. 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 Mm -hmm. um, I'm Nell McGlynn King. I'm from Connecticut. I uh, live in Hamden. Hang out in New Haven a lot. Um, I, let's see, I'm a white, queer, cis chick, I think. <laughs> and, and how are you related to Charlie King? I'm his daughter. <laughs> that sounds like a song. Yeah. <laughs> Just pick that name up. <laughs> and you're working in the dance community? I guess, oh, uh, I work actually as a, as a substance abuse and mental health counselor in a, a community um, center. And our community health center, and um, I vo I'm a volunteer organizer for a social dance group um, that was it's through Yale, um, but is open to the general public. Uh, one of the few Yale social groups that is, um, so it's called Yale Swing Blues and Fusion. Well, I think we're going to have some interesting perspectives from from dance, from theater, from music, and we're obviously we're all here at this you know, music themed event. And let me just sort of start off and say, you know, my perception of, of so much of the music that so much of us enjoy comes out of, you know, the African tradition that, you know, uh, and so many people, you know, in this room at this conference, you know, are, are white. And I think that that was the sort of the genesis of why we wanted to have this discussion today. and. What it, you know, how, not just how we can reach out, but, you know, how can we, we respect those traditions <laughs> and, and make sure that everybody feels invited and, you know, all those issues. And, and to be a person of color in this world, to be performing for a predominantly white audience, what that's like, and versus, you know, to people of your own cultural background. So lots of different questions. I don't know if any, anything, burning jumps off uh, that you'd like to address first. Well, just what you, just playing off of what you just said, um, 
in this country, a lot of our musical traditions um, begin with African Americans, and as soon as the white people learn them, uh, they get paid for doing that same uh, cultural tradition, and the black people don't get paid and don't get credit. So we have a tradition of black musicians introducing something, white musicians picking it up, making money off of it, and the black musicians can't make money off of doing the same thing, so then they have to develop something different, which then gets picked up by the white musicians who make more money off of it, and the black musicians change to do something else because they can't get paid for doing what they were doing, the second thing they were doing, so they develop the third thing, and the white musicians pick it up, get money, make money off of it. So there is a fear of bringing your craft and having it stolen. Because we don't have the situation where we support people like they do in Cuba, uh, where you are supported with housing, health care, um, education, and then there is no copyright law because um, they feel that uh, culture belongs to everybody. But here, we get paid for culture, so it becomes a big money thing and a big stealing thing. Um, so how do we invite people uh, and let them know that uh, we will not steal from them? That, that's a great question. I'm, I'm curious if you've thought about that to the point of the question. Does does an answer or a couple of suggestions occur to you? You know, I can I can say for me as a as a as a performer. My, you need a microphone. Oh, yeah, sorry. For me as a performer, sometimes I, you know, like say for instance last night, I had some control over who we invited to the concert, so we tried to make it a diverse program, um, and. You know, sometimes I'm in that situation where I have some control over, you know, who else is on the bill, that sort of thing. And, and that's one way that occurs to me to, you know, help, you know, help other people get get acknowledged for, for what they do. If I, you know, able to give them an opportunity. For instance, you know, probably the coolest thing the Rolling Stones ever did in a long history of making money off of, you know, African music, African American music, was... They were invited to be on Shindig, and they wouldn't go on unless Helen Wolf was on the same bill with them, which was, you know, uh, you know, a, a, a pretty nice moment. But again, you know, the Rolling Stones are doing pretty well. It is interesting that the Rolling Stones are not North American, True. not yeah. U.S., yeah. Um, yeah. and that so many black performers had to go to Europe, including mm -hmm. Tina Turner, to uh, and to then return <coughs> to the U.S and be able to make a living. Anybody else? Hey, uh, you know, I just want to uh, also expand on um, the, the conversation. I think uh, the fact that uh, we are already saying um, an aspect of diversity, I think that diversification, first I have feelings about the terms diversity and inclusion and equity. I use a lot of those terms in a lot of work that I do as well, but it's still a diversification of something that is white, an inclusive yeah. inclusion of a space that's white quite often, um, but that we actually just determine those different terms. Diversity tends to be about representation. It's about what is seen, what is looked at. Um, inclusion actually takes into consideration the person on the inside and the way they're feeling. Do I actually feel included in this space? I may be sitting up here in this panel and therefore it's a very, very diverse panel and it looks that way. But what what are the ways in which this, this actually makes me feel welcome and to want to be there? A lot of programs, a lot of things that exist right now are all about diversification. So it's about numbers, it's about visual, it's about representation. But what are the actual ways in which institutions and individuals 
are working on themselves to make a space feel inclusive. That once that person gets there, they actually feel like they're a part of that system, not just a representation or a token or anything like that. And equity actually, uh, the third step of that being equity of like, how do we actually change the balance of system? So the persons <laughs> who are making the choices of that diversification and inclusion actually represent the people who are marginalized and oppressed. It's actually putting them in positions of power to be able to make those decisions. So it, it's about unbalancing some of the things that we've already said and learned. Um, so I just want to clarify as we continue using the language, and I think um, for me that's part of it is just that knowledge of how we actually take this this information, um, and and when, when especially when I talk about inclusion, it's it's that idea of like how do we embrace. Um, one of the things I want to be clear of, like a lot of us live in ignorance. And I say ignorance not as a bad thing, it's, it's just the aspect of not knowing. I'm extremely ignorant of many, many, many things in the world. Um, and I would challenge anyone who feels like that they are not an ignorant person in any way to ask you, like, you just do not know someone else's experience, period. You're ignorant of the experience, done. We all have a bit of that. So I want to take away the shame from that right away. When we shame people for their ignorance, they hide it and then they never choose to have a conversation about it and, and discuss. And communication is so key when we're talking about um, creating equity and undoing the systemic and institutionalized oppressions that have happened that create these kinds of environments. Uh, that's a lot of information. I just want to set that as like a foundation of part of this conversation. Yeah. Thank you, Peter. And, and Peter, um, if you don't mind maybe you know, being here as an, as, an, as an Asian American, you know, we have such a history in this world of thinking of race and racism as a black-white issue. And there's lots of colors out there in, in the world and, and, and different cultures. And, you know, in our society, you know, there's lots of other cultures who aren't represented or, um, uh, you know, sort of acknowledged. And I'm sort of curious in, in your own work if you feel in touch with your sort of historical culture and if you bring that to your work. <laughs> um, oh, uh, do I bring it to my work? Without a doubt, definitely yes. Um, you know, uh, it's interesting because I think about, um, I, I very much attach to a lot of these conversations. I, as my work as a director, or producer, uh, writer, as a theater maker, I'm constantly thinking about people who are in oppressed and marginalized situations. Um, I, I gravitate towards a lot of Asian and Asian American stories simply because um, that is the experience that I can identify the quickest with and um, still need to spend a certain amount of time doing that research. But any time uh, that narrative kind of comes up, I start, I, I throw myself in there because it's really, really important to me. Um, but I would say whenever I get into these conversations, uh, I've, I've spent so much time uh, checking my privilege in some of that, that I actually now more consciously, and, and still not enough, like we'll spend time figuring out what are the voices that are missing, what are the spaces that are missing. I, whenever I enter these environments, the first thing that generally comes up for me is where are the native voices, where are the indigenous people's voices, and what, what land and space have we entered that was theirs, that it has been taken up. Um, so I, I spend that time, you know, thinking about those things, and then I create the art that I do. But I also talk about, um, I, I've actually just recently started a class uh, called uh, Acting Beyond Marginalization, which is just people of color, a space just for people of color to come and work. And part of what that is, is because I'm not just looking at the actual art form, um, <laughs> but I'm also looking at the process in which we educate and create the art, and how oppression lives in that. Um, and it, it's, it's really interesting because I, I'm just finishing an MFA program, but what I spent a good time dealing with and learning was all the ideologies in which I was being trained were white and European centric. Um, and that's not labeled. It's just, you're being trained in directing, you're being trained in acting, but there's a lack of that knowledge of what is the actual, um, where, where are the history and the roots of these. Right, right. Um, so I've actually been spending a little time that I'd like to spend more, like what are the traditions in rehearsing and creating artwork that exists outside of them? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I just wanted to respond also to Terry's question. Um, we haven't begun yet to understand the history of what happened when 
white <laughs> uh, Europeans made their way to the west coast of this country where there were people who we would now call Mexicans who had lived there forever and where there was actually a large influx of people from Chile who were part of the gold rush and of course we know that people from China came over <coughs> during that time and then strangely you know a couple decades later there was actually a law passed saying no more Asians could come but the other people what happened to them is not talked about and there's all sorts of ways one could approach that question, but just in terms of music, there must have been something absolutely fascinating going on there for a short amount of time, and how uh, Central and South American music traditions have also worked their way into North American folk music is a topic I would love to have a parallel life in order to explore. Um, <laughs> I just want to share an anecdote, which is that in research for a play I was doing, I found a letter written home from an Irish immigrant who was working on a railway saying, um, you know, the Chinese workers who we work with are good, they're, they're fine people, they're, they do good work, their music is terrible. And what this means <laughs> is, <laughs> there must have been music. Yes. On the railway, like in the Sierra Nevadas, they must have been playing music around a campfire or something. But we have no record of that. And if there's some way that that can ever be discovered, I think we will learn quite a bit about uh, you know who we are and who we have thought we have been as Americans for a long time. But there we have a lot of work to do. And, and I'd love to see the letter home, you know, to China describing you know, the music that they heard of, you know, out of town, uh, you know, out of tune, the 1860s banjo. Right. <laughs> but that's very interesting. But then, you know, the next sort of follow-up to that occurs to me would be so again, in you and your theater work, if you took that on, you know, would you would you you know try to cast you know sort of racial appropriate, you know, in the roles that you're casting, or, or would you try to collaborate with people from that culture if you were writing a show about that, or how would you approach that, you know, sort of as a white person wanting to look at these other cultures? <laughs> okay, practically speaking, <laughs> yes, I would try to make sure that the cast was not all white people. <laughs> this is a, I mean, big topic in New York Theater Day, which we could talk about at greater length than anybody wants to hear, but it's like, it's it's actually a job that each casting director now knows they can either be very good at or very bad at, is knowing where to find actors of uh, non-white ethnicities, or, you know, it's, it's so, like like Peter said, there's no way of talking about this yet that doesn't, all, that doesn't still assume whiteness as the base, which is completely wrong for the story that this play Want, would want to tell, right? Um, oh, I had something else I wanted to say, but it will come back to you. Well, re re recruitment, uh, there are different, each culture has their means or mode of recruitment, uh -huh. and often um, white <laughs> program directors or, you know, administrators of whatever who want to uh, include people from other ethnicities have no clue of how to approach. Uh, they don't know the newspapers, they don't know the radio programs, they don't know the radio programmers, uh, who can all be instrumental in recruiting, uh, letting people know that, uh, you know, auditions. Uh, and then the, the audition process is a Western process, too. Um, I know as a... Um, a black singer, uh, I resented a friend holding an audition for something that he was doing when he knew what certain musicians could do and really he needed to ask. Um, because if you have an audition process, you just automatically are gonna get a whole bunch of white people. And a, a lot of, of black and brown people who have been rejected over and over again are not going to put themselves up for more rejection, <laughs> but they will take an invitation. So. Interesting. <coughs> Neil, do you want to uh, talk about that in the, in the dance community? Because I know certainly dance tries to represent 
you know, traditions, you know, from all over the world? Yeah, um, I have so, 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 so many thoughts. I'm going to try and pare it down a bit. Um, first of all, I want to uh, sort of thank you for, um, you know, the, the idea of ignorance not necessarily being a bad thing. It's just that we all have in certain areas of our lives. Um, I started, I got into um, partner uh, social swing dancing a little over five years ago. And at the time, it was just, uh, you know, it's a fun thing to do. It's energetic. It's a beat. Great. I've always wanted to try this out. And um, I had no idea that I would be, uh, so, you know, over the years more and more involved in these discussions about cultural appropriation, which in swing and blues um, dancing has become a pretty hot button issue. Um, there's a lot of angry Facebook posts about it. And um, my my introduction um, was just learning learning basics and then learning about blues dancing, which I hadn't known was a thing, and a lot of people coming into that, you know, they've seen um, swing uh, choreographed in films, and, you know, it's sort of more known about. And blues music uh, was, you know, people had this knowledge of that, but not that there were dances that went along with that. So that was sort of the beginning of my learning process. Over the years, what I realized was that, um, uh, to my understanding, and I'm still very much in the learning process with this, you know, in the um, in the 1990s, swing had this sort of 90s revival um, that was also part of like sort of the ska movement. It was very white, it was very young. Um, there were a bunch of really sassy, upbeat bands that came out, um, and then so swing dance sort of also had a revival around that. Um, last sort of as a side bit to that, in the last I don't know, like 10 or 15 years. Uh, blues dance initially um, was brought up as this sort of like, this is what we do late at night, and this is like the sexy side of swing, which we then, you know, over time realized that's complete BS. We weren't actually even playing blues music, um, not real blues music. We were playing stuff that sounded slow and sexy. So there was this like just massive amount of ignorance. Um, about that, and uh, you know, I want to really give a lot of credit to <coughs> members of the the blues dance community and swing dance community who you know spoke up about this. Um, the few people of color who you know, are left, uh, the few black people who are left in the community, um, and then the people who were conscientious about speaking up about, about saying, you know, you are you're not actually doing what you're saying you're doing, and that that's appropriation, like. Perfect. That's like 100%. You're taking something, you're cherry picking the things that you like about it the most, and you're turning it into your sexy dance, and you don't have any understanding of the culture, you don't have any understanding of the history. Um, and I'm lucky in that the community that I'm part of took on, you know, we, we started a process of just educating ourselves more about the history of that. So, and it has just opened up this huge world, and I just have, I'm, you know, I'm still in the process of learning so much about that. But there's also been more movements because as blues dance itself has become more popular and there's more you know, interest in that, not as a side to swing dancing, but as its own form, now you get people who are uh, competing and people who are teaching and people who are making money off of it and they are almost all white. And you get bands who are playing and musicians and they are almost all white. And so recently there have been movements um, among some of the organizers to say like, hey, I'm gonna <laughs> say, I'm not gonna go to your weekend event unless you hire black dancers, unless you hire black musicians, like make the effort to actually connect with this culture. So there are these efforts being made and there's just, a, there's still a lot of sort of infighting about what does that mean? Is that tokenism? Is that, you know, or do we, you know, do we try and like advertise more to the black community? Are we going out into black communities and, you know, trying to learn more about what's, you know, what's currently being danced there? So there's just a lot of, um, there's both a lot of growth and also a lot of conflict happening there. Um, so, I don't know, I kind of got off track of this original question. <laughs> <laughs> so many things! <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, we did good. We did good. Um, yeah. So it's, uh, it's just, the, it's, it's really, it's both, it's heartbreaking to see that like, blues music is the, like it's the original, to, like African American art form and it is the root of so much music and so, you know, so much art. And it's, history has been, you know, in many ways just 
hidden away, literally like locked in vaults by rich white men who were like, I want this record, I found this record by this, you know, that's never been heard by this blues musician. I'm gonna lock it away and nobody's gonna hear it. And so there's just, there is so, the documentation around what was happening at the turn of the century and these amazing artists has just been kind of, not completely destroyed, but really um, sort of faded out and sort of kept under wraps by people in power. Um, and this slow sort of uh, unveiling of that bit by bit over time has been really uh, inspiring and amazing to see. And I think, you know, I just want to give credit to the people who have been working really hard for years <laughs> and years to bring that to light and talk about it. So. so first off, I wanted to apologize on the uh, behalf of Brian Amador from Soli Canto, who was hoping to be here this morning to be a part of the discussion. We really wanted him to be here and also bring you know, his perspective of working for so long in um, Latin music. And um, they had an early <laughs> sound check that, that, that they had to do for an obligation that they had. So um, so I apologize that he's not here. And 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 then, um, so, I, so I wanted to um, ask Lucy, since Brian's not here, to also answer this question of the opportunities that you've had uh, to perform for more audiences of color rather than a predominantly white audience, if that affects your program, if that affects the, the back and forth energy of performing and, and sort of what you give and what you get that's, di <laughs> that's different. Um, very key question. Um, there have been uh, groups well, individuals and groups of black performers who uh, do cultural music <laughs> from the tradition um, and they, their audiences are predominantly white because those are the people who can pay um, or it's, it's easy in this market-driven uh, environment. Um, that there, are, of course, are people who perform, black performers, musicians, singers, who um, sing in black churches, who get paid by the black churches to, uh, to lead and teach, um, although there's more money on the white side. Um, <laughs> and so you have uh, black performers who are paid by white churches to lead and teach. Um, I have uh, consciously not made records because the people I want to share my music can't buy the records. Um, the, uh, and, and I'm more interested in people singing together than listening to singing. You know, a, a participation <laughs> as opposed to consumption. Um, and uh, I want to, uh, there, there are people who have been very successful in producing the consumer goods and getting people to participate, and I want to lift their names up. Uh, Oscar Brown Jr., uh, Chicago poet, uh, singer, actor, radio, drama, person, wonderful history. I hope you all Google or, or, or do the readings and listen to Oscar Brown Jr. because he had rehearsals in public housing projects with public housing residents, with gang members to diffuse gang activity. Uh, and this is, we don't talk about this, and this is a model of a, a really community-involved artist who was an artist at a very high level, who uh, was nation, local, national, and international. Uh, the song that you may have heard him, um, that he did the words, Mongo Santa Maria from Cuba, did the music. Dream of a land my soul is from. I hear a hand stroke on a drum. <laughs> Shades of delight, cocoa hue, rich as the night, afro blue. Two young lovers face to face with undulating grace. They gently sway and slip away to some secluded place. Shades of delight, cocoa hue, rich as the night, 
Afro Blue, Oscar Brown Jr. Mm -hmm. um, someone else uh, I have to lift up is Frederick Douglass Kirkpatrick, who led the singing at Resurrection City, uh, 1968, the campaign that Martin Luther King was working on. And of course, the song that he had every, <laughs> everybody's got a right to live. Everybody's got a right to live. And before this campaign fails, we'll all go down in jail. Everybody's got a right to live. And of course, Resurrection City was bulldozed. Everybody was chased out at gunpoint. Um, so much for democracy. Thank you. And you know, just an interesting thing that you sort of said in what you just said, you mentioned white churches and black churches, and that's another example of the way, you know, that our, our country is still segregated. Well, you, can you, you know, we think of, you know, I, I can think of, you know, a Korean church and a Haitian <laughs> church and, you know, all these different types of churches, but I, I can't think of an integrated church. You know, I, I know there are Unitarians out there kind of trying in their way, but I can't, you know, but I, but I can't, Think of a sort of a successfully well integrated church, which is just an interesting. There are a couple in Washington, okay, D.C., but they that's are good to know. few and far between. Yeah, that's good to know. And again, you know, that the gift of music is maybe one thing that can help do that. Very helpful. You know, so um, since we have both both Rick and Peter here, you know, who you and, and I hate to mention things without putting names on them. St. Stephen and the Incarnation, 16th and Newton Streets Northwest, where a lot of you may have slept on the floor <laughs> when you go to a demonstration, yeah. and uh, All Souls Unitarian, which is just yeah. down the street. Yeah. Cool, thank you. Um, but since Rick and Peter, you, you both self-identified as being gay, you know, that's another culture that, you know, has, is, you know, can be a distinct culture and then is in a way mainstreamed or appropriated <laughs> as people, you know, like an artist like David Bowie who made a lot of money off of pretending to be gay. Um, you know, sort of what it's, you know, sort of what it feels like for you and being in theater, you know, maybe it's not as much of an, you know, of an issue, but probably a lot of your audiences might be predominantly straight and what, what that dynamic is like. <laughs> <laughs> well, for one thing, David Bowie was totally gay. <laughs> oh, I'm sure. No, I, uh, I, never um, I Yes, I have. Um, t I will say that my experience of performing folk music. Um, which is always a term that I, oh, is it okay? Um, I don't know exactly where the edge of folk music is for me, you know, um, but performing for like folk music series in folk music venues, I have tended to find that the audiences seem to be majority straight. Um, and I, I, I want to say that they have been extremely welcoming to me throughout my time performing there, which starts in the 1990s, so I know that's not a complete story at all. Um, and it's been very interesting to see what has happened. There is in Chicago a man named Scott Free, who uh, organizes and has for, for at least 20 years um, a series called the Queer Is Folk Festival. and. Um, Although that is called a folk festival, and it is performed at the Old Town School of Folk Music in Chicago, uh, the variety of types of music is very broad. And, uh, and this is a testament to Scott's ability to reach out to a lot of different people, but also just the fact that, that there isn't really a queer music right now, and I don't know if there's a queer culture. If, if, if there is, there are certainly a lot of queer people who do not feel like they are part of what people think of when they think of the dominant queer culture. And even the fact that we can use the phrase dominant queer culture now <laughs> indicates yeah. that something has changed rather drastically in the last 10 years. Um, Isn't that a whole other subculture? 
I mean, that's the thing. <laughs> oh, that. <laughs> we just made a little in-joke. It's a quiz. <laughs> um, um, I, I think that one has to honor the fact that the experience of being queer is different for each person. It's certainly different for David Bowie than it is for me. And um, Holly Near is another person who comes to mind who, you know, we, Holly is wonderful. We all love Holly. <laughs> Holly made a statement that has been resonating in my mind for many years, a concert that I was playing with her in Madison, Wisconsin, probably almost 10 years ago. She asked the audience to, well, she asked people in the audience to raise their hand if they consider themselves to be an ally. And a number of people in the audience raised their hands. Actually, probably the majority of people in the audience raised their hands. And she said, I want to take this moment, which will be different from many other moments, to thank you for the experience that I know that you have of being yelled at quite a bit by me and by people who you are allying with. Um, and this was a, a beautiful moment for me, actually. For, but what I personally went through in that moment was to realize that, yes, I have done that. I have found the person who is the closest to me, both physically and ally-wise, and I have made that person be the recipient of a lot of anger and a lot of stuff that I really needed to say to somebody else who, however, would not listen because they are not an ally. Um, and I, I actually did that for many years to some people that are really, really good friends. <laughs> and so I, um, I do think that that dynamic is something that we need to always be aware of. Uh, Peter referred to the experience of trying to make sure that people understand that being called out on ignorance is not really about shame. Uh, you've also said the same thing to me about the word privilege, that the word privilege is going around. There are problems with privilege, but the fact that each individual person has some kind of privilege, you can always find someone to whom you can compare yourself to whom you do have privilege. And that is something that, it, it doesn't work for us just to say, well, I'm gonna to try to get rid of all my privilege, or I'm gonna to try to describe myself in such a way that I sound like I have very little privilege. That, <laughs> that as Peter says, is, is actually shutting down the very conversation that we need to make sure is happening. What I have found is that if you look at an audience filled with people who look straight, that's just the way they look. And it's interesting that that is a, you know, a situation that gets talked about a lot. Queer people, they can look a particular way, and for years and years we needed to. Um, for some of us that has changed recently, but for a lot of queer people it has not. It is still unsafe all over this country, and I'm, you know, even in a place like Boston, we will find people in their 20s who cannot look queer. And so we won't know that they're there unless we do something. What I know of is a lot of plays and a lot of songs which explicitly have queer characters in the stories that they are telling. And I was trying to think earlier of like, do I know a comparable number of songs that have, for example, interracial relationships in them? And the answer is no, I don't. I can't think of any. I'm Ebony like, and ivory <laughs> are together in perfect harmony. <laughs> Perfect. But I mean, like, <laughs> one song. like a story about like two people with names who got married and had a kid. You know, like, can you think of a story like that in a folk song? Like, it must exist. I'm not saying it doesn't exist, but it's like, it, it's embarrassing to realize, oh, I should be able to think of one right now, and I the. So there's something we could do. We could fix that one pretty easily. We could fix that by tomorrow. You know, I mean, so this is one thing. In order to make people welcome in a place, how about not surrounding them with stories of everybody but them? Yeah. And one thing that I will say, and I'm going to be a little snarky, but that's, I mean, I said something nice earlier, so I can say this. Um, one thing that used to really bother me and my partner Andy and the Prince Michigans was that the folk music community used the word family a lot. And they used it in a really well-intentioned way, but then we would hear, you know, she's not here, but like we all love Pat Humphreys and we love her songs, and what does she mean when she says our children will carry on? What's she talking about? Is she going to have children? She could, you know, I'm not, you know, I'm not 
I'm not dissing her in any way, but like that almost struck me as a kind of a strange cognitive dissonance there. And I understand that like when you want to talk about the future, you need to use a metaphor, and children's a good metaphor, right? But what if you're not someone who's planning to have biological children? Where's that story got to be? So, you know, oh great, it's a metaphor. We're writers. We have the ability to find new metaphors. And I'm going to brag. Um, some of you know my song, Ministry of Oil. And in, thank you. <laughs> She's mentioned this to me like three times a day. So nice. Um, it includes a verse about the future or about a potential future, and it has the line: "If you know things are going well in the future, and then the line is, I'll take my class out someday on a field trip." And literally, this is an example of a songwriting process uncovering something because that was the place where I was like, I know that this is the place where I would write a, a line about my children, but I don't want to do that. I'm not planning to have them, and if I do, they'll be adopted or something, you know, so it didn't seem right. So I was like, well, what's something else that I might have in the future that this would work for? Yeah, field trip. I love field trips. Field trips are great. And, you know, this is the way that, like, I, I talked about this in the Melody Workshop, too. Sometimes you just have a problem, and you're trying to figure out how to solve that problem in the number of syllables that you got in your song. <laughs> Go for it. Like, this is, like, the encouraging moment. It's like, you know, see what the problem is, and then be like, well, if I do something else than that, then suddenly I will have an expanded vocabulary. And with that vocabulary, I will start to talk in a way that paints a different picture of the world. And that might include other people that are included in the way I've been talking so far. If I could just say two things. Um, we have this view of our biological children as being our property. And of course, the laws here support that. <laughs> But um, there's also the sense that our nieces and nephews and our neighbors' children are our children, are, are the children of our generation. So I hope people will think of it in that way. And, you know, we don't all have to have children. Um, some of us better not have <laughs> children. And um, the other thing is we have a social climate of dominance and submission, which uh, it's like we're in this pool and we can't help but getting wet. We're all in it and and it's uh, we have to really uh, thrash around uh, uh, to keep uh, to keep balance um, and to not fall into the dominance and submission which is what I hear shaming is about being dominant and putting somebody else down and um, so learning respect, and there are two organizations that see in this culture that teach respect. One is the 12-step movement, uh, which has its issues. It does teach people how to talk to each other in a respectful manner. And the League of Women Voters. Great. And Marsha, we are going to open it up for questions but in just um, a couple more minutes. Um, since Charlie's, Charlie's not here and uh, to ask this question, but we sort of had this pre-discussion and, and so this is one thing that we made sure was, was included in the little description. So since I'll be Charlie and just ask, ask his question. Mic to mouth. Um, what are some intelligent and sensitive ways to reach across boundaries with the intention of improving diversity and equity, or at least communication? And I, I feel this way a lot. You know, I'm obviously white, um, really obviously white if you get to know me. Um, and, <laughs> and, and, and so I, you know, I want to, Again, you know, acknowledge and, like a and acknowledge and honor the fact that you know a lot of the music that I perform, even in my own writing, comes you know comes from comes from the African tradition, and you know, and there's so many issues about racism now. And so, if I want to start a conversation with a person of color, you know, what's a, what's the most respectful way, or or a person you know of a different um, you know sexual preference, what's the most respectful way? that I could initiate that conversation without uh, offending the person or, you know, why is this one more person of the mainstream culture wasting my time? You know, is there is there a good answer to that? One of the, well, I think, I think there are tactics to doing that. Uh, I think also that there is an acknowledge, or a need to have an acknowledgement that 
uh, actually sometimes no means no. Um, you know, and, and that sometimes I'm just not interested. Um, and that's okay. And I think sometimes there's this want sometimes to be, uh, oh, well, if you just understood this, or if you knew this, or you, you would, I, I understand, and I'm choosing uh, that, that that is not for me. Um, and, and knowing that that is okay, and, and, and looking out to other uh, communities of whatever demographic you're looking to, to, uh, to bring in. Um, so so I, I do want to acknowledge that. I think it, for me, I, I go to the easy comparison of like, if, if I am having a Bible study and I go to like the, the like local mosque and, and advertise there, like I should not expect people to come um, <laughs> because it's, it's just different. And, and there's an understanding of that. So uh, sometimes that exists for whatever we're really excited and passionate about, someone else just won't. And they understand it and they know it. And so accepting that is one thing. Um, I will, uh, on the flip side of that, uh, I will uh, acknowledge and embrace that as, uh, uh, America, as a society, America has also um, quote, quote, Americanized a lot of people. Um, and so there is this kind of acknowledgement of uh, what, how certain communities have been social conditioned to accept uh, whiteness, heteroness as the norms, maleness, and so that there is a bit of um, uh, disruptance that's happening there for, for some communities. Um, and so everyone's kind of in different stages of how they want to associate with their race and with their different backgrounds and with the other as well. Um, so sometimes it's, it's about not, not making about that, <laughs> if that even makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I totally lost track of the initial question that you were asking, <laughs> but, but, but it, it raised a lot of these thoughts in me, and I just wanted to express those. Yeah. Oh, yes. No, no. Um, yes. Uh, I have a couple thoughts. Uh, one is I was at a summer gathering for PMN a couple years back, and there was a similar panel about um, where are all the young people in the folk movement. Um, and, you know, I think it, it, it reminded me at the time of a lot of uh, the discussions we've had in the uh, Swing and Blues dance community of where all the black people in this black art movement um, and the and how do we bridge that gap and the conclusions were very similar of if you want to engage a group of people that you don't see represented go out to a community that is not yours you know you you make the first move don't just stand on the porch shouting like come over here you know and not in like a huge crowd like go <laughs> as a person as like one or two people and go and experience a culture that's not yours and see what's happening and see, you know, um, my friends and I would go out to like local bars and listen to local music and dance and people would come up to us and be like, that's amazing. And you know, you give them a card and like sometimes they show up and sometimes they don't. Um, so that I think that's one piece of it is just go outside of your comfort zone. Um, and then just coming from sort of a, a therapist headspace of, um, you know, I don't think that ever approaching somebody uh, and ask, like, being like, you should educate me. It's your job to educate me. I, that's never fair. Um, I, I try to phrase things um, just from years of evaluating people and trying to get them to tell me their entire life story in an hour. Um, just the <laughs> idea of like creating a space for somebody to share what they want to share, saying something like, hey, I've been hearing a lot about this. What is your experience with that? Or do you care about that? Or, you know, do you have thoughts about this? Um, I did that once. There were actually as a, in a moment where I'd been reading a lot of articles on cultural appropriation, I went up to one of my friends at work who's black, and I was like, well, what, do you, what do you think about that? And her answer was, what, what are you talking about? What's cultural appropriation? I was like, you know, I'm like, white people take black people's style and steal it. And she, she was like, I don't care. You know, and like, some people don't, and some people really do. And it's, you know, it's, we're all individuals at the end of the day. Um, but I think not like, not saying like, you tell me what is the black experience or what is the gay experience or what, you know, and I mean, queer is like, it's, it's, David Boy was totally queer. I don't know if he was gay, but he was totally queer. <laughs> <laughs> totally yeah. queer. 
Yeah. So was Prince, and I'm pretty sure he only dated women, but that guy was queer. You know, it's just like there's just a huge, it's a whole world. Um, but yeah, just opening up the floor to somebody and and listening and just like taking in whatever they're saying, even if it's not the answer that you wanted or, you know, um, and witnessing, I think, as well. So. Thank you. Lucy, did you want to respond to that? Yes, I did. Okay. Um, is this, oh, yeah. this seems to be on. Um, in what I have observed uh, among many uh, white people who think of themselves as liberal, that because the, um, and I think of uh, the Phil Oaks song, Love Me, Love Me, I'm a Liberal, uh, which talks about those white people who are not as liberal as they, or not as progressive uh, or inclusive as they want to see themselves, um, that they <coughs> will tend to bypass the person of color who represents a group or who is involved in a group and pick the person who is isolated, um, weak, maybe sick, uh, maybe drug addicted, alcohol addicted, that they feel more comfortable around that person because they can look down on that person. That the, the dominance and submission is so uh, prevalent in this society uh, and that when we uh, want to bring people together, we need to bring people in who are organized, who uh, actually have a relationship with their people, uh, a, a healthy relationship, um, or perhaps elected by their people, um, and uh, can really, uh, when, when they come in, they bring a group. They don't just come in as individuals that can be puppeted by the, um, the white puppeteers. Thank you. Peter, and then I know we had a couple of questions. Yeah, I'm just going to add to that. I think uh, one of the things in, rec in, in this conversation, too, is first, rec like a, an element of self awareness, awareness. Recognize your privilege. Where do you actually have privilege? Where does it fall in race, sex, gender, class, ableism, uh, national, nationalism? Like all of those different aspects, understand where your privilege comes from and how do you take that privilege and utilize the power, resources um, that you have because of that privilege and help those who don't. Uh, have um, taking those actual privileges um, to be able to help those communities. So instead of inviting them into your space, you're elevating them to have a space that's equal to yours, and it then is actually easier for there to be balance and either integration or coexisting that 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 can happen there. So I think it's it's really that self uh, understanding yourself first, then educating yourself, and then take actually being able to take action. What can you do? with these things that you do have that others don't. Um, to me, I think is, is one of the best ways to be able to really start looking at it. And when I think historically, uh, thinking of the iron workers in, um, in Louisiana, uh, that work used to be done by African people. And uh, then they were told to train white people and then the white people do the work and, do, and, and the black people are not or the African people are not trained in that work, and so the, the skill is not passed on. The skill has passed from African to European and, and stayed there, and now we have all these uh, people whose ancestors did wonderful iron work but have no clue uh, as to the, the skills. Uh, and we have something similar. I've seen the, the children uh, the sorrow is the children of black musicians don't know music, mm. don't know instruments. You know, their fathers or their grandfathers, mothers may have played uh, beautifully, but the, because um, Reagan took the music out of the schools mm. uh, and a lot of people aren't going to church, so the traditions, the skills are not being passed down. And uh, I hope that we even though public schools can be weird, we do need to have play, pay music teachers to teach mm -hmm. children so that uh, we're not left with just scratching records and uh, some other um, musical, uh, you know, we need to learn violin and clarinet and bass and uh, kettle drums and all those other wonderful uh, instruments, chora and harp and 
All right, thank you. I know Marsha had a question over here, and then if anybody else does. Well, I just wanted to say, um, I um, have a mic, Marsha. Oh, yeah, okay. thank, thank you. you. I'm, um, I'm not exactly happy to acknowledge my ignorance, but I readily acknowledge my ignorance. Um, and I know that because of my position of white privilege and um, cisgender privilege and so forth, um, I'm constantly stepping in it. Um, that said, the music that floats my boat is not, I, I love the European stuff, I do, but what really gets, gets me going is um, the blues and the swing and the jazz. And um, I want to communicate my enthusiasm for that music um, to my students who are young and white and privileged. Mm. And so um, I have listened closely to um, our colleague Nick Page talk about how do you actually lift up this music, perform this music, and um, acknowledge where it comes from. And I am interested in two things you know, like where the rubber hits the road, he's got some very concrete suggestions. So does anyone on our panel have concrete suggestions? And the other suggestion is, hey, why don't we have a white allies workshop at PMN? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No. Um, so what you're talking about is actually a thing that we addressed as part of our uh, process um, in the swing and blues community um, of how do, you, how do you lift this music up and how do you lift this dance form up without just taking what you want from it and benefiting from it? And we taught, we started working history lessons into our dance lessons. Um, we kept it brief, you know, um, people came to dance, but we started out by, here's an example of Delta Blues, here is an example of Louisiana Jazz, this is what, and then there was, you know, we talked about um, people migrating up to Chicago. We talked a little bit about Chicago Electric, and we talked a little bit about the Harlem Renaissance, and we played examples of music from each one. Um, and we did all of that before we got them into dancing. Um, and it's just, you know, some people are gonna grab onto that, and some people just came to dance, and they're not gonna grab onto it, but you at least plant the seed. Um, I, I think that that working history into the art that you're teaching, and where does it come from, and what's, you know, and what is the state of it today? And saying like, hey, this is the art form of a people that everybody has benefited from, and this is a people that is still hugely oppressed um, and murdered and you know kept beaten down in all of the ways. So, and acknowledging that, even if it's uncomfortable, especially if it's uncomfortable. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Um, so. Can somebody pass him a mic? Uh, the mic cord won't reach, but if you want to come up and talk into the mic, come, or just come down, stand come on yeah, down. Come on down. <laughs> you should be on the first one. Yes. Um, thank you. So, uh, this bell might not work, but. Yeah, good. Yeah. Thanks, Terry. Go ahead. Okay, so, um, I cut. Uh, I. I uh, what Sister Lucy Murphy said resonate, uh, at the beginning of this presentation resonated with me very strongly. Uh, and so I wanted to sort of make a comment about um, your, your, your introduction uh, and with something that I hope will be helpful. Uh, so if people will bear with me a little bit. So two uh, years ago or two winters ago, I came to the Winter's Gathering. Uh, at the time, I was the only, I don't know how you describe it, Hispanic, Latino performer. I felt as unwelcome, as you can imagine. And I made the joke to Ben, I said, uh, I almost felt like I was playing in Sun City. <laughs> I made some also, some of the jokes, uh, but it, they were, as somebody said, snarky, because I, I actually felt very unwelcome, and somebody, a few people actually just also called me out names. So. So, so um, I, I told Ben, I'm never coming back to this thing, are you crazy? Ben said, no, it gets better during the summer. Still, I decided not to come back. Uh, I decided not to come back. Uh, um, but I also uh, felt that just being critical without contributing anything is quite unfair. So I wrote a letter to Ben with a suggestion, 10 suggestions to 10 points to address the issue of diversity and I'm with you and representation and so on and so forth. And I asked him to please pass it on to the 
uh, steering committee or to the directing board. Uh, and uh, to his credit, he did. And I got a response after a few months. And the response was, uh, we don't think that this is a problem. And so uh, I, I don't take my words exactly, something along those lines. So uh, we think that we're doing fine. And so we think that we should do things our way and not your way. So thank you for your suggestions. This was all done in a very friendly manner, so I don't really have a complaint in terms of how it was done. Uh, my letter probably wasn't as friendly as it should have been, but, but I had the 10 suggestions. I made sure that there were 10 of them. So that's a little bit of work of how to improve the diversity and representation within um, uh, people's music network. Uh, I made also the joke that uh, you couldn't call yourself, uh, you know, people's music. You probably should call yourself white people's music. <laughs> and if you continue calling yourself people's music, they work. The, uh, the people might come back and take the name back. <laughs> and just simply say that. So, so I wasn't necessarily the friendliest person in this regard. However, uh, I think that there is a, a way uh, to, to improve the diversity of the group in such a way that it will contribute to its growth. Uh, by, so here's what I invite folks to do. Talk to, the, to, 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 um, to Ben and the steering committee and said, dude, what about this letter? Two years have passed, you guys said that things were gonna improve, so, but, but yet we come to this discussion on, on diversity. Uh, and I also actually came because I thought Brian was gonna be here. Uh, I actually do know him and I was really looking forward to see what he will say. Uh, now that I am disappointed that you're here, I'm very glad you know, for your comments. Uh, but I would invite you and the panel and everybody else to just basically go to, to, to Ben and to the steering committee and say, you know, so, so we gave it a chance. So why don't we start looking at uh, this suggestion? It's not because we're, they were my suggestions. They came from many, many people. And that included sort of instituting something that we'll call affirmative action. It worked for the Army. It worked for other groups. Affirmative action means a lot of things. It means that one of the suggestions was, if you're going to have a performance by what performance, you would only allow a person to perform if they are coming with some a person who is not mainstream, uh, and so on and so forth. And also. Uh, something that you, you, you referred to, which is, you know, the training. And, and so, how would you talk to, like, you want to talk to, you know, uh, communities that are underrepresented? Offer training. You know, people appreciate developing their skills. Uh, promote, promote them. I will, you know, I will never play if I don't invite, you know, a sister to play with me. Playing with guys is just, it's old. It's, you know, we don't need to do that anymore. If we are, you know, five guys playing Latin American music, I walk out of that. Uh, so, you know, I, I play with the sister, otherwise I don't play. Uh, again, with this event, uh, there's a, a problem. I, I will not come to this People Music Network. I mean, I came today because Brian that we're always going to be here. Uh, but otherwise, I will not come. I will not be complicit to a group that looks like Sun City. Uh, I think I said too much. I... No, 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 thank no, you. No, thank you. Thank you. Oh, sure, my name is Carlos, and the letter was written in my name, and. And, and again, I invite what? Suarez. Oh yeah, my we, God. We, we know each other. We, <laughs> we, we, so the, one more thing that I want to say, which is, uh, people use their work as a system for a long time. There was a time during the 80s where it was much, 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 much more diverse. Mm -hmm. And but you know, people go in different ways. Uh, but also, the organization changed. And so it is not like oh, we always been this way, and there is no choice. Why the country? Uh, it was much more diverse in, in its initial um, aspiration, and it has become what it is now. Uh, so, again, I would insist. Uh, I would encourage and suggest, invite you to go to the steering committee and say, listen, two years ago there was somebody who sent a letter with 10 suggestions. Let's think about it. You don't have to do all of them. Some of them, think about it. So we get a chance to see it. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. If you can do that, I'm Terry Kitchen, so I'm pretty easy to find. Could you host it, or else it can go on the list? Okay. Yeah. Well, we'll make sure that happens one way or another. I know one of the things was that half of the steering committee uh, was to be women. I think there was probably something about gay people, but I think at the time most of the steering committee was gay, lesbian. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
<coughs> and queer. Yeah, uh, and, and the other thing was that half would be people of color on the steering yeah. committee. Yeah. Okay. So uh, Martha and Mara, but I'm going to say one thing, which is we're these are going to be your last two comments, um, and then we're, we're out of time, but we're going to segue right into the community meeting. So it's not just a matter of talking to the steering committee. It's a matter of when openings come up in the steering committee, if you have ideas to contribute to the organization, you can put yourself forward or, or, you know, or someone else. Um, but so um, I saw Martha and then Mara. Yeah. Okay, just I was going to say the same thing that you said at the end, Carlos, which is we were much more diverse. We started to lose uh, people of color, and um, we got to a point where there was no longer a critical mass. And once we lost that critical mass, we were in trouble. And it's been, we've never been able to get back to it. And I would like to think about how we can do that. And uh, yes, we had quotas on the steering committee, um, including uh, uh, numbers of people who were gay, there had to be a certain number, and people thought I was hilarious when I said that. But at the time, we only had one person who was straight, everybody else was gay, but since then, it's changed. Thank you. First of all, I, I want to say to Carlos. Oh, take a mic. Yeah, take a mic. That helps the video. <laughs> awesome. Hi. First of all, I want to say to Carlos, I'm appalled, angry, mm -hmm. um, incensed, et cetera. So although I can't speak officially for the organization, except I've been a member for 30 years, um, not only is it an important conversation, it's one that has been going on for a long time. So I don't know what moment in time you ended up with that conversation, because we've had that conversation many, many times. Um, the other thing I want to say is I really appreciated the panel unpacking those words we use all the time, like inclusion and diversity, et cetera. I am a professor of inclusive education, and so I totally am fine with the fact that there's problematic language here. I want to challenge, and maybe it relates now to the Carlos's issue that he raised. I want to push a little on the word ally, because even though I do workshops on be, being a strong ally, I think it's also become really commodified. We have like the allied industrial complex, you know, and. Um, I think the important thing to, so some of the people I know who do anti-racism work talk about being an accomplice, which is a very different role. It's like, I'm, I'm going to get into this with you, not like, oh, it's great what you're doing, because there's often a sense of distance with the ally thing. And the other thing I want to say about this, even though it's hard, is that you can't declare yourself an ally to a group. They have to say that they experience you as an ally. And so I can go, I'm an ally to black people. If they go, hey, G. Mayor, we don't, uh, we don't get that from you. So uh, you don't get a little merit badge. Like I went through diversity training, so now I have my ally stripe. I got my queer ally stripe. I got my black ally stripe. People that whom you think you are supporting are the ones that should be telling you uh, how you're doing. That you should be asking them. That thing I just said, was that good, helpful, no, uh, uh, et cetera. And I think it's a humble position. It's often very painful, especially, I mean, I say to do this work, you have to be prepared to make lots of mistakes and learn to apologize. Um, because, you know, I'm not an expert. I give workshops, and I step in it all the time, too. So the ability to be humble enough to say, okay, that was an attempt, you know, um, and it happened in my class just last week because I was putting people in groups and I said, you know each other, you two know each other, and I was just doing my usual grouping things. And one of the women in color said, you asked me if I knew the other woman of color, and I experienced it as a microaggression. Mm -hmm. And I'm telling on myself because I was like, oh, no, you know, something that I felt that I was doing that was sort of innocent that, that I would have done any other time. Like, what are you two are sitting together? Are you friends or, you know? So it's the ability to start to stop being defensive and go to learner mode. And so help us, and we shouldn't have to put the burden on you. This should not be his job at the steering committee to fix it. It's our job to fix it. All of us informed by what you can tell us. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you so much for coming. We want to thank our panelists. Lucy Murphy, Nick Burkhart, Peter Kilo, Nell, Nicole, and King.
and uh, I'm Charlie King, and, uh, <laughs> and on to the meeting. Thank and you, the meeting is here or down there? Cafeteria. Uh, cafeteria, cafeteria. The meeting's in the cafeteria. <laughs> Thank you so much. I don't see that many.